you and welcome to uh, Dr. Elizabeth Forge Freeman. Um, she's been on uh, an amazing two-year journey, uh, both a sabbatical uh, and then welcoming the youngest of their children, a beautiful uh, young woman who is going to become a future WLP member, I am sure. Um, <laughs> But uh, Elizabeth was our inaugural uh, junior faculty award winner, although even when uh, we provided her that award, she was n not junior. Um, almost, uh, sorry, now my son is texting me from the kitchen while he's <laughs> cooking dinner, which is awesome. Hey, um, <laughs> so, so Elizabeth almost immediately... Um, almost immediately after becoming our uh, junior faculty award winner, um, she, you know, racked up amazing bona fides. She's a, a Fulbright award winner. Um, she has uh, been named a Ford Foundation and a Reed Foundation fellow, um, just on and on and on, and, and is uh, a exceptional uh, published author, thought leader, um, and, and just a, a really amazing human being. And we're so blessed to have her as part of the WLP family um, and as a fully tenured professor at the University of South Florida, which is really awesome too. Yay. Um, so uh, with no further ado, I, I say thank you uh, again to Jessica for her amazing leadership in this uh, series and uh, welcome and thank you, Elizabeth. All right, before you get started, Elizabeth, I'm going to go um, just over some logistics um, for this evening. Um, we want this to be a very conversational evening. Um, this is a very conversational topic, and I know that a lot of people have questions. Um, so during the um, this evening, if you would mute yourself at first, um, just so there's no feedback on anybody's microphones. Um, but we are going to be using both the chat feature, um, which if you roll your mouse over your screen, you'll see um, a little speech bubble and you'll just click that and you can put any of your questions um, throughout the evening um, there and we will address them in an ongoing basis. And then if we don't get to all of them during, we will um, finish up at the end. In addition, there is a um, raise your hand feature, which is right next to the chat button. Um, so if you have a question throughout the evening, you can raise your hand there and I'll be able to see you so I can call on you. Um, when you are asking your question, if you would just introduce yourself um, so that everybody knows who is talking, especially um, there's some people who either don't have their cameras on or are calling in so we can't see your name. Um, and I, those are all the notes that I wrote down. So um, without further ado, we welcome um, Dr. Elizabeth Horge Freeman. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I, I'm really, I'm really excited to to be here. You know, when when India and Jessica reached out, I had to say yes. Like I, I always say yes to WLP, um, not just because they've supported my research, although that's part of it, but really because I believe in the mission. And I've really enjoyed seeing how WLP has grown over the past um, few years. What I want to say, I want to start off by by just kind of contextualizing some of the ways that WLP has supported me. So one of the earliest ways was through a fellowship, a research award that I got that allowed me to go to Brazil to finish the book that I finished really just to, really recently, this book on um, modern day slavery in Brazil. And so my funding from WLP allowed me to go to Brazil to take to do that research. And now the book has is finished and hopefully will be going through the publication process soon. Um, but what's interesting about this is that that project was about labor exploitation and about companies and about these questions about labor that I, I have increasingly been interested in. And, you know, I, I mentioned that I feel excited about talking to you all, and that's kind of an odd thing to say, especially given the context. But the reason why the what, what's driving my enthusiasm is, is me seeing what's been happening with people, with me seeing how many folks who had never thought about questions of systemic racism ever um, and anti-racism have now been reaching out to say, what exactly is this and what can my organization and company do to really integrate these ideas of anti-racism and systemic racism into what we do? And so because I've been asked to, to do these presentations, and I was mentioning this earlier, that I literally just left a two and a half hour facilitation on this, on, on this topic, I really thought it would be beneficial 
for the WLP community to hear some of what I've been talking about. Uh, in particular, because I know that the that a large number of members of the WLP are white women. And that sometimes means that you haven't necessarily been in spaces to ask these questions or to feel comfortable asking whatever question you have about racism and systemic racism or even racial categories. So I really thought that this would be a great place for me to create a safe space for you all to ask these questions and for me to give you some concrete strategies of what it means to move from a diversity model that I think a lot of companies use when they think about um, about their, their companies, moving from a diversity model to really having a more, um, really moving towards anti-racism. And so I wanna, to, I wanna basically talk about what that looks like. Let's see if I can get this to work properly. How's it looking, Jessica? Okay, so I can't see you. I don't really like doing it this way because now I can't see your reactions. I can't see if your eyes are glossing over because you're bored with what I'm saying or not. So I'm gonna trust Jessica, your face is the only face I can see. So I'll trust yours as the, the indicator. So, so what I wanna first start off by doing is just outlining what I plan to do. I wanna start off with a really quick interactive activity where I'm gonna show you something and I wanna give you a couple of minutes to, to write down to yourself what, what comes to mind. And then from there, I want to talk to you all about how to move the organizations that you're part of, the, the groups that you're part of, how do you move them from talking about diversity to anti-racism? What do those things look like? And I'm going to have you, I'm going to give you some scenarios and we'll be talking through how to, what examples are examples of anti-racism and how can we even elevate the conversation even further? And then we'll end by giving you all a chance to ask me more specific questions about the activities or about anything else um, that you're experiencing uh, related to this topic. So this is the picture. So I want you to, and we won't necessarily use the chat box for this. If you have a piece of paper handy, or if you, actually if you don't have a paper handy, you can use the chat box. I'm going to show you a, a picture and I want you to, to write what you're thinking about this picture. What comes to mind when you see this? What, what are you drawn to? What, what's the, what am I trying to show here? Oh, love, I'm, this is great. I can use my phone, I can see you all typing things in. This is great. Some of you have already seen this, I'm sure. Those of you who are faculty members, don't cheat. I know you've seen this. You've probably even used it in your own work before. Um, okay, so I can't see you, but can somebody, can somebody create, okay, so somebody said creating equality. Somebody said equality versus equity. Pleasant, somebody with the last name Pleasant said that. Pleasant. Could you please tell me what you meant by that? What do, what do we mean by this? Creating equality versus equity. And Crystal, you can go ahead and unmute yourself if you would like to talk. Oh, Crystal. Okay, Crystal Pleasant. Or you can type it in the chat if you want to. Or, or anybody else. Oh. oh. Crystal says she's trying to, but her network um, is having poor quality right now. Sorry, Crystal, Crystal if you want to type, that's okay, can and I can read it out. Can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, so um, with the left picture, um, you're putting everyone at the same, you're you're giving someone a boost up, but with, e with equality, we may have, um, we may have the same opportunities, but yet we can't. So on the left side, you'll see everyone has an equal um, level box. So, but if you see the smaller child, he can't actually see anything. Whereas, so that would be considered equality. We have an equal size box, right? So we, we all have an equal opportunity to, um, let's say, um, Oh, we can't really we have use access. We have because, equal we're right, giving, yeah. right. We're giving equal access versus on the right side that that's equity where you recognize that there are certain people in your group that don't have the same type of opportunity. So you leverage to meet people where they are. 
And so that's where we are with equity. That's great. And you know what, what's really important for this conversation about anti-racism is that, you know, I know that this is about equality and equity, but oftentimes when I facilitated conversations, one of the first things that people say is, well, I don't see color. I don't see difference. I just see people. And one of the most important concepts is that we actually need you to see race and color in order for us to actually uh, implement anti-racist plans. So in this first picture, if you say, well, I don't see difference, just give everybody an equal box. That clearly isn't good enough, right? So by being able to see difference, by being able to redistribute those resources, in this case, the box, you can get to a position where everybody can see. Now, that's not where it stops. Because I, the, this, this, the sequence actually continues. So I want you all to think about what this shows. And in the, in the chat box, tell me when your impressions of what I'm trying to show here with this third image. What is this progression showing? Participation. Oh, somebody said participation. I like that. What removal, else? Removal of barriers. Remover, yeah. Removal of barriers. Exactly. Somebody said this is where we want to be. Yes, this is where we want to be. Let's see. With the heart added to that. So this is where we want to be because so often what we've been thinking about is how can we work, how can we create this workaround systemic racism if we're talking about racism? What can we do to get around this? And ideally, we really want to shift how we're thinking about this all together. We want to talk about action items that, yes, end up redistributing resources, but ultimately the goal is to dismantle systemic racism. So in this conversation about anti-racism, essentially the main point is that I want you all I want us to have a conversation about how the policies, the practices in your companies or organizations can move us forward to, to address some of the immediate concerns, but with the long-term goal of really eliminating systemic racism. And so that, that's exactly what these pictures are showing. Now, I'm, I'm using this word systemic racism, and what has become apparent to me when I give these facilitations is that folks aren't totally sure what I mean when I say racism. We have a broad understandings of what it means when, when, some, when we say racism. And I'm not going to go into all the iterations of it, but I think that it's important for this conversation for us to, le to at least break down what we think about as individual forms of racism and then systemic forms of racism. So, so generally speaking, when people think about racism, they often immediately go to these interpersonal relationships. They think about stereotypes and prejudice and how all of these lead to discrimination, right? And what we know, if we step back a little bit, is that stereotypes, of course, exist about things beyond race and racism. Um, but for racism, people often immediately go to the one-on-one. -on -one -to -one. I'm not racist because I don't use derogatory terms to, to talk to people. Um, and that's certainly an example of interpersonal racism. And this matters. This matters in terms of the types of cultures that you're producing in an organization or a, a company. But what increasingly um, has been on the minds of, of folks these days is moving away from talking about just interpersonal, person-to-person, one-on-one type of uh, discrimination or, or, or bad treatment and really moving towards thinking about systemic racism. So I'm going to say some things here that might make people feel uncomfortable, right? When I, when I do these presentations, depending on how often you've been in conversations about this, some of this can be surprising uh, or people, people have a, a visceral reaction to me explaining what systemic racism is, is. And I want you to embrace the discomfort to be able to hear um, what I'm saying about systemic racism. So when we talk about systemic racism, we move beyond the one person to one person model and we think about how policies, practices, rules and the norms that really uh, drive our society, well, they're embedded in all of our major social institutions. These practices, policies, rules and norms are, have been established in a way that cumulatively benefit white people and those perceived as white. Now, this is huge. When I, when I get to this point in these presentations, folks are like, wait, what? I'm, I'm getting these advantages. I'm, you're saying that white people are privileged. Yes, that, that's exactly what racism means, that whiteness is at the center of this. We're talking about not only just a hierarchy where, where white people are advantaged, but we're talking about uh, an entire system. All of our social institutions have been designed with the benefit of white people in mind. So when I'm talking to companies or organizations, the first thing that I say is that we need to look at the practices. 
the policies. Many of them look on the surface to be uh, non-racial, but there's some taken for granted assumptions that shape them that end up uh, reproducing systemic racism. The other thing I wanna mention is that um, in conversations about uh, white privilege and whiteness, in, in the past conversations that I've had, sometimes companies don't quite know what to do with how where Latinos, where Latinos fall, right? You know, there's a concern that we're talking too much about race and we're not talking about Latinos. I think it's important to remember that those folks who are, who are categorized as Latinos or Hispanics, that's actually an ethnicity, right? Within that ethnic category are different racial groups, right? So black people who are Latinos in many ways face some of the same barriers that we see if we're talking about black folks who are not Latinos. Um, so being able to talk about white privilege, white supremacy, which is a gross, a gross word, a really difficult term for people to come to grips with, but we really have to be able to center that and understand that to be able to move forward in an organization in ways that, that help us to disrupt that. Now, speaking of disrupting that, the, the first thing that I want you to do, I, I've mentioned individual or interpersonal relate, or racism and systemic racism. So our activity right now will be for you to look at three examples that I'm going to give you. And you're basically going to tell me using the chat what which which of these are uh, individual and which of these are systemic examples so in your chat box you might say a dot i or s individual or systemic so i'm going to give you all a couple of minutes to just do a so a is an example of what in florida black women make on average 62 cents for every dollar paid to a white man is that individual racism or is that systemic racism Three people have, oh, four people have answered. I'm gonna give you all a couple of seconds for that. All right, this is this is a, in a, a unanimous. Can anybody explain why is this systemic and not individual? How do we understand that? This is Marsha. It's because it's general. It's it's a group of, of people who happen to be black women that we're talking about. So it's overall the community. Right. This is this is considering what's happening to black women across organizations. This is not just a one on one. One person is mean to the other person. Great. Let's go to B. The white owner of company X refuses to mentor any black or lat Latino employees. Individual or systemic? So, so far it looks like everybody said I, because they put up the system. I said somebody wrote something I couldn't quite understand. So overall, overall, overall people are saying individual. Can I get somebody to explain this? This is actually a tricky one. When in the facilitation I just did, interestingly enough, people said, that's actually a little bit of both, but most of you all are saying individual. Help me, help us understand why this is individual and not systemic, anybody. So it's Doreen here, I'll try. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I'm gonna say it's because it's the the owner, even though it's a the, the base of it is because it's an owner and it's influencing the whole company. But I think it's because it's the owner's belief, I would say it's individual and that individual is you know showing racism. So that would be that interpersonal racism that he or she is is demonstrating. Um, and so I, that's why I would say it was individual. Does anybody, so I, that makes perfect sense. But there's also another argument to be made. And it looks like one person here in the chat was brave enough to say something else. Do you want to talk about that, Leanna? I don't want to put you on the spot. I hope that's okay. Sure. Um, I, I think it's because the owner is a uh, reflection of the systemic racism that exists in that company. So what's interesting about this one, when I wrote this, I, I wrote it to mean individual. That was what I had in mind. However, I think an argument could be made. What, what folks were saying is that if we recognize that this doesn't just happen with company X, that there's actually a history of lots of other companies doing the same thing, not providing mentorship opportunities for Black and Latino employees, then we can see it as systemic. I wasn't necessarily thinking that broadly about it. Um, but if we think about it like that, absolutely, we're talking about systemic racism. This 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 uh, quote alone doesn't give us enough information. Um, but like somebody is saying, it's interesting that uh, Jill is saying here, 
<laughs> and you didn't know it could be a hybrid answer. Um, what, what Jill is saying is that we can we don't know what's happening here. We know that this owner is treating these folks like this, but we don't actually know how widespread it is. This actually could be systemic. So I didn't give you enough information to make the systemic racism argument, but I like that you're already anticipating how that could easily be something larger. So that's that's excellent. Um, Oh, well, let me, there's a question here. Somebody said, well, what if it's a leader in a company, not the owner? Would that be individual? Well, the quick, an the quick answer to this is that it would be individual, but the reality is that this is an individual action, but it actually could have a, it could have a broader systemic impact. But when we talk about systemic racism, we're actually not just talking about one company or organization. We're talking about patterns of discrimination, um, and ways that organizations outside of just one reproduces that. But an argument could absolutely be made for that. And an argument could be made that within this institution, there's a systemic, there's a systemic racism problem that, that extends from this question of mentorship. Last but not least, C, Natalie, a teacher, does not read emails from black parents because she says, well, they only complain. Individual or systemic? C, individual or systemic? Oh, folks are getting a little bit more complicated here. People are saying both. Okay. Oh, is that Darlene? I'm looking at my cell phone, Darlene. I think I saw your name here. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Hello, Darlene. <laughs> um, India just said she's a dreadful person. Okay, not you, Darlene. <laughs> um, so th there's, some, there's some variety here. Somebody who selected both. Tell us why you would say both. Anybody who said both, there are, there are lots of folks who said both. Anybody want to take a stab at this? <laughs> this is Marsha, I'll take a stab. Well, okay. individually being Natalie, because she's the teacher, she is individually racist uh, exactly. against the black parents. But I also think that it's systemic because of her beliefs that it's the parents being plural, that it becomes systemic. Thank you. So I, what I'm hearing folks do, and I, I like this, I think folks are, are using information beyond what I'm giving them to think about what the implications of this behavior could be. So Natalie and herself, she's exhibiting a type of individual racism. But if we take this further, and if we understand that there are broader, broader patterns and ideas, stereotypes, and prejudices about Black parents, and we think about the fact that it might not just be Natalie who's doing this, and if we think more broadly like that, we can easily see how this has the potential to be systemic. But with the information that we have, if we didn't know anything else, this would be an example of individual racism. But it's great to be able to link individual racism to the potential to become uh, systemic or to be connected to systemic racism. Now, why is this important, right? You know, we, we can differentiate between individual and systemic racism. Why is it important and what can we do about it? Well, it's important uh, understanding these distinctions, uh oh, understanding these distinctions uh, is important because oftentimes companies and organizations aren't necessarily prioritizing this question of racism, systemic or individual. What typically happens is that companies and organizations are using this traditional model called the diversity model. It's all about the numbers. Let's up the number of people who we hire for staff and leadership. Let's look at our numbers. What percentage is black? What percentage is, is Asian? What percentage is white? Let's look at that. Let's increase the representation in publications and materials, put some brown faces here and there. Um, let's target more of these uh, groups to be clients. And this sounds, some of you are thinking, yeah, well, this is exactly what you're supposed to do. What's wrong with this? This is, this is good. This is not bad. But we need to go beyond this if we're trying to be anti-racist, right? This is, this is baby step one. But there are also some other problems with using a diversity model that I want to tell you about, because I think it's likely that some of you may have that model in your own companies or organizations. So sometimes when we use the notion of diversity, companies use that as a way to not speak about racism. It's a strategic way to avoid talking about racism because we can talk about gender instead. We can talk about LGBT issues. We can talk about disabilities, but we're going to put racism on the back burner. And let me just say, talking about race, gender, uh, LGBT issues and disabilities, those are critical issues. The argument isn't that they're not critical. It's that companies strategically use them 
as a way to avoid talking about racism. And they can use the diversity label to do that. Sometimes with the diversity model, you also end up having these superficial gestures. So I mentioned having a few black and brown people in the newspaper or in your, your ads. Well, money that's spent on that superficial publicity could actually be redirected to projects that would have a more substantial impact. And even this question of hiring more black employees in particular can be a problem because the diversity model really cares more about the present that the number. It doesn't really, it's not as concerned about retention, about people's actual experiences in the organizations and companies where they've been hired. And, and that's a problem. And then lastly, when you have this diversity, this diversity model, uh, often that comes along with very sporadic diversity training. So you might have a, a diversity training once or um, once a year, once every three years. But what we know about these trainings is that that's not enough. Um, they, they actually have to be consistent and they have to happen much more often than once a year to make a difference. Now, let's step back because some of you are thinking, wow, I thought I was doing okay with my diversity model. Uh, we see lots of faces here. We like the diversity. I'm not saying that diversity is bad. What I'm saying is that this is an opportunity to elevate things, right? We're talking about anti-racism here. We're not just talking about diversity. And the reason why that's important is because what we know is that in a racist society, it's not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. It's not enough just to have uh, people's faces there. We actually need to be actively involved in efforts to dismantle racism, to disrupt racism. So when we talk about anti-racism, we're not just talking about being nice, showing some people in some brochures. We're saying, let's dismantle for, for the sake of that, to bring in that, that, that visual that we had. Let's dismantle that gate that's separating people. That's what we're ultimately trying to do. And to do that requires a level of personal accountability. So you can't be passive. So a person who's non-racist is, pa non -racist is passive. They'll say, um, well, I didn't treat that person unfairly. Yeah, but you didn't say anything when somebody else was doing it and you were right there, right? So it's about taking a much more active role rather than a passive role. Um, it, this also goes back to actually seeing race and color in order to be able to actively combat racism. So there's a tendency in the U.S., there's actually a concept called colorblind racism that describes the tendency, particularly uh, white people's tendency to, to, to believe that if they don't see color or don't see race, that that's a good thing. But in fact, that actually, that doesn't move things forward and actually makes it very difficult to confront real differences that are caused by systemic racism. And then lastly, when we're talking about anti-racism, we're talking about power and resources. And so as you're thinking about this presentation and thinking, does my organization, is my organization anti-racist or not? One of the ways that you can think about this is how are the how is power distributed? Who has the resources? Who decides where the resources go? These are some of the critical questions that I think will, will allow you to think through whether or not your organization is doing a good job at being uh, anti-racist. Now, of course, I'm a faculty member, so you know I have to ask you some questions and give you more examples to to make sure you understand the bottom line here. So I'm gonna have you go back to your chat. Number one, here's an example. I want you to tell me if the person is non-racist or if the act is non-racist or anti-racist. So starting with number one, the person says, I don't ever use racially derogatory terms to describe people of color. They never use those words. Is that non-racist or N or anti-racist A? I don't ever use racially derogatory words to describe people of color. I'm just looking at people submit. Okay. People are in agreement on this one. It's pretty, it's pretty unanimous here. Can somebody explain how we, if this is non-racist, why is it non-racist? Can anybody explain why this is non-racist? Okay, this is India. Hi, India. It's, hey, um, it's because it's just you. You're not policing or trying to affect change in a more global way. You're just um, satisfied with what exists in your own pond as a person, so, as a culture. So this is interesting. So, so, so India said you're not really concerned about 
making change. What if this is not crazy? And and the uh oh, was somebody trying to speak here? I'm sorry, I was going to say the same thing that India did pretty much. Okay, it's what the person's what she's not doing as opposed to what she is doing. Yeah, yeah. Doing. yes, it's the passivity here. She, she, yes, she's not using any words, but what is she doing? She's not saying she's actually intervening when somebody does do it, right? So it's really about actively, consciously, consistently uh, undermining um, racism. And we don't see that type of activity here. That, that's exactly right. So the passivity part is important. Uh, and it's great that the person never uses those words, but you have to do something. Number two, this is, this is a bit trickier. I was excited when we hired two new employees at our company. That was supposed to say two new black employees at our company. I was excited. <laughs> Excitement. Is this non-racist? Is it anti-racist? Non. Okay, people are saying non. So somebody who said non, how could we elevate this to be anti-racist? What would an anti-racist response be more like? Anybody who, who believes that this is non-racist, how can this be elevated to be anti-racism? The person Doreen doesn't here. I was, uh, it's Doreen here. I was just gonna say that if it was that we reviewed our policies and we changed our recruitment and hiring strategy, then that would be anti-racist because we're doing something to actually look at the process as opposed to just looking to check that we have an increase in numbers. Exactly. Okay, so they changed the policy and then they hired somebody. How can we take anti-racism to the next level here? What, how can we elevate this even further? And that's not necessarily for you to answer, <laughs> unless, you, unless you like no, to. No, I think it's great because it's, it's true. It's asking to keep on going for the why, right? Yeah. We have to keep on going uh, deeper, but and maybe it's looking at how do we ensure that we're inclusive and, and like you had mentioned the retention, right? So if we had to change the policy to have someone come into our organization, how do we have to change the policy to have them stay with our organization? Yeah, how do we take it even further? There's another level here. Now, okay, that's not necessarily for you though, but there's another level here. So how do we get them to stay? Okay, I like the direction. There's another uh, level here. What's the I'm other gonna, level? I'm gonna, I'm gonna chime in. Okay. Um, this is Jessica Brosser, um, but I think um, because we don't know who this person is that is excited about um, ah. new black people. We don't know if they're in leadership. We don't know if um, they're a coworker of these two new hires. Um, so I think it's it's going out of your way to be welcoming and to, to understanding um, how they are adjusting to this new company, um, how they are being acquainted within the company and understanding that and then also listening. If there is a problem, then the person who is excited can be an ally and can speak with them um, and for them in a space where they might not be represented. I like this. We're elevating the conversation here. And the other part of this, Jessica, is that um, this excitement could actually be elevated to anti-racism. It's great that the person is excited. Let's assume this is a white person who's excited about two new black hires. Um, one of the things that you said is that you can help them become more acclimated to the company culture, but that might also mean that you introduce them to people in your network, right? It means that you actually bring them in in substantial ways and not just a hello, goodbye, but you really go the extra mile to really make sure that this person is, is incorporated, especially mm -hmm. given what we know about um, access to networks and how racism shapes access to network. But there's one more level here. I don't know if anybody will say this. There's one more level that we can kick this up one more notch to make this more anti-racist. So the person was excited. The person oh. wanted to make sure the people understood the, the environment. Let's say they got them connected to networks. How else can the company make sure that this is an anti-racist agenda after they've hired them. What else this, could this is Moira. You could put them on the pathway to become a member of the recruitment committee. So now you, what you're suggesting is that you're giving them a level of power here, right? This is this is now we're shifting here. They're not just an employee, they're given a responsibility where they have more power. Now power is more distributed, they're gonna have an extra role. The last, la the the last level of that might be that you also set them up to make sure they're prepared for advancement. So it's not just about their, them having a position, it's about them also progressing so that they can move into leadership pro uh, process 
And that, that committee that you mentioned uh, could be part of that. So having that whole plan, that, that has to be thought out. All of this has to be intentional. I'm going to skip over number three and go directly to number four. The person says, I stopped my colleague when she made a racist comment to tell her that it was wrong. Non-racist or anti-racist? Anti. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. You, were, you were so excited that you just had to say that. <laughs> but people, people are fast with that one. They all agree. They were excited as you were to say anti-racist. Um, and this is an easy one. This is an active thing that folks can do right now is to really step up. And I talk about this in um, one of my one of my YouTube episodes is this idea of what does it take to be a good ally? And there's certainly more difficult things that you can do, but there actually this idea of standing up and saying something is so critical. And I want to give you an example that came up in a past facilitation that I did where um, a black woman was talking about how after the board, after a, a company meeting, someone had said something racially offensive. People looked around, it was clear that it was offensive, but nobody said anything. After the meeting, her white colleague came up and said, you know, that was a really, that was such an inappropriate comment. And the black woman, you know, she was appreciative of the comment, but she said, well, why didn't you say something in the meeting, right? It's not, you, you, you have to be able to use your voice, especially if you're in a position of privilege. Uh, that's really important. Uh, so that is certainly an example of anti-racism and the beginning of the types of actions that lead to change. Now, I want to go and talk specifically about what anti-racist companies look like. What are some of the characteristics? Because I know you all probably want some meat. You want to leave here feeling like, okay, what does it take to be anti-racist? An anti-racist organization has a clear and consistent message and anti-racism is part of that. It's not a, a side thing off the side that we also can do some of that. They center the importance of anti-racism and they are constantly reinforcing that message through everything that they do. Uh, they're also really transparent. So what that means is that companies on the road to anti-racism, they sometimes engage in what's called a racial audit. They want to find out who, where are staff, um, how does racism shape uh, who, who we hire, how long people stay, how quickly they advance, how much they make in salaries, how they feel about the, the, the climate. So one of the things I've been doing with some of these companies has been to, to, to even just administer a racial climate survey. Some of the, some of the organizations you know, really didn't think, they said they didn't really think they had a problem, but after the surveys came back, they realized, oh, okay, okay there is something happening. So companies who are serious about being anti-racism, yes, they do that climate survey, but they go even further by really conducting a serious audit um, of how racism, how systemic racism is impacting a number of processes. Um, the other thing that they do is that they still engage in education. I mentioned those diversity trainings, but an anti-racist company doesn't just do it once a year or even twice a year. They're very consistent about doing it numerous times. And not only do they do that, but they are also tracking whether or not the trainings are effective. Are these things worthwhile? Do people see the value? Is this shifting the company culture? So you can't just do the diversity trainings just to check off the box, but you have to do the follow-up and have accountability. And then when we talk about anti-racist organizations, they have a strategic plan. And we, we started talking about that a little bit in the previous slide, where it's not just recruitment, it's not just retention, it's advancement, it's mentorship, it's salary, it's the, an entire model that recognizes all the different ways that systemic racism and, and really white privilege can, can function to leave others out of the pipeline. So this, as you can tell, this takes work. This is not something that companies wake up one day and say, you know, we're going to be anti-racist tomorrow. This takes uh, effort, it takes time, it takes expertise. And in this last category, what it takes is research. And so this is one of the things that I think is most interesting, that companies who are serious about anti-racism in their annual reports right alongside net profit, uh, return on investment is a, is a section on anti-racism. They take anti-racism just as serious as they're taking these other kind of more traditional performance indicators. They're using the same robust uh, research models to study anti-racism and they're holding people accountable for results. And this is a lot. The, the reality is that companies and organizations are at different point. Some of you might be look, thinking, looking at this and thinking, okay, I am so far from this that I don't know how I'm going to get there. But the reality is that it, it takes steps. This is not going to happen overnight, but you want to have at least a plan of where you're hoping to go um, 
as an organization. And I think that this model kind of gives you a sense of what's possible. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to exit out of my presentation so I actually get a chance to see you all so that for the next um, 20 minutes or so, what we can do is talk more generally about some of the questions that you have or maybe some of the challenges that you're facing. You know, what, what are some of the key issues that you believe might be holding your own company or organization back from being able to move from a diversity model? And some of your companies might not even be at the diversity model. Some of you might actually be in companies that aren't even, that's not only is, is racial, is anti-racism not on the table, but there could be um, an explicit, um, rejection of this right so all of us are in different places so this is really an opportunity for you to to ask the questions that you think um, would be most useful so i'm going to stop talking and let you all volunteer to ask questions or leave your answer in the chat if you would like to and let me also say this as you all are thinking of what to write um, so your questions could be more about anti-racism and diversity, but this is also really a space for you to ask pretty much anything that's related to racism and anti-racism. And, and, and I say this because in the last session that I did, um, folks had just these basic questions about language. You know, they had a question about uh, what's the difference between Latino and Hispanic? Why would I use one over the other? How do you think about Black and African American? Maybe you already know this. Maybe those aren't issues. I think for me, I didn't realize that that I, I'm used to using a certain language, and so I, I know the rules about this. But other people don't necessarily know that. So this is an opportunity for you to ask whatever question you think would be useful for you. Um, so yes, so I'm going to wait and see what folks type in or raise their hand uh, to ask, so that this can really be geared more towards what you all want to know. Jill, practice. Uh, oh. Yeah, go oh, ahead, Jill. Jessica, you no, you do your job, Jessica. I'm gonna let you. Be, uh, um, I'm Jill, you can go. Uh, yeah, I can't figure out how to raise my hand, which is ridiculous. You're good. I you're good. good. All the time. Um, I just was real curious. I'm I'm a member of a couple of different organizations, but uh, my first thought, and it may be beyond the conversation here, but is the university. Are there examples of universities that are doing this kind of thing? I know we've asked for audits and that kind of stuff, but I'm thinking about their reporting and their accountability. And I would love to see for my own organizations I'm involved with um, what that audit looks like. I'm not right now. You don't have to go into all of that, but you know, I wanted to follow up with you in email. I'd love to see that. So that's, that's my question. Yeah, you know, so this is a really great question. It's something that I'm in particularly interested in uh, as it relates to just thinking about USF and, and what, what's our step ahead. There are actually several universities that in response to various incidents on campus created different positions to, to deal with this question. You have campuses that have now associate vice pro presidents of diversity, inclusion, and equity, for example. You have special assistants to the president and provost who work on these issues. What's been really interesting is that um, the response is really quite varied. And what those different organizations, what those different bodies do uh, varies. But what we actually, what I think is interesting is to think about where USF is. I mean, just as an example, since I know more about USF, um, we actually do have an Office of Institutional Equity. They released a report. Um, but I think the question is, what happens when that report is released? Who, who's actually over making sure that we've actually met our goals? And I think that that's often the disconnect. People know we need to collect the data. Um, and it, it's just, and universities actually have to report on this data. But I think the next step is, let's step back and analyze whether or not we're making the progress that we'd like to see, hold ourselves accountable with some metrics. And if we're not, let's be proactive at changing our policies and procedures. So I think a lot of universities are on the right track, especially with some of these new positions, but we really, we're not really seeing the type of, um, they're not really, I don't think that they're usually, they're leveraging the data that they have to do what they could do to track and to implement policies. Um, and let me, let me, I know I'm speaking very generally. There are some other universities and I've actually started looking at some of these that I think have a really interesting model. Um, I was looking the other day at the University of Iowa that was, that was interesting to me because they ended up creating a position in response to black faculty who had said, you know, what is happening here? What's happening with the students? What's, that, what's happening with the faculty? Um, and so I think that you have several models of what universities are doing, um, but it's sometimes difficult to know 
the extent of their racial audit, because that's usually not as publicized as the general overview of what's happening at a university. But there's certainly a model in terms of what what should be what should be assessed, what what's what's reasonable in terms of expectations. That is there. There, there are workshops that people have organized for that particular purpose. So we can, but we can certainly talk more offline on that. So you can, if you want more information, definitely uh, send me a message out. I think Jessica has already distributed my email, but certainly feel yeah, free to yeah. email me. Thank you very much. Um, and then Marsha um, will be next. Marsha, you can go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Okay, yes. sorry. So I, you were talking about what language or what's the difference between African-American and black and I, you know, when this first whole um, Black Lives Matter after um, George had passed away, um, I I was one of those people who just didn't know what to say or what to do. So I found just as a reference was um, Emmanuel Echo um, had done the uncomfortable conversation with a black man. Black man, yeah. And I thought that was so well done. I only saw the first two and I need to go back because I think he does it on a weekly basis. But I thought that was so superb when he it tried to explain it to white people. Yeah, no, I, I think that, I mean, this is what's been really interesting and really, which is why I wanted to do this is because um, I've gotten so many messages and emails and, and the reality is not, I, I talk about this a bit on the, on the, the YouTube channel. In some ways, I, I make fun a bit of, of my, some of my white colleagues and I say, you know, you've, you've reached out to me and you've said these things and they're really problematic and I love you. And I know you mean well, but, but stop. Um, <laughs> But I think it's also at the end, I talk about the fact that I have to also be patient for a lot of these folks who have never had to confront thinking about racism or thinking about their own whiteness. It's actually unrealistic for me to think that they know what to say or that they're going to say the right thing. And I think that uh, part of what part of what excites, what excites me about you all being here is that what I see is this interest in learning more, this willingness to say, you know what, I, I don't have the answers to this. Maybe that's actually something I should know, I should have known, but I didn't. And that we have to, we have to meet, we have to meet people where they are. Um, and I think if watching that series is helpful, that's great. If reading um, Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility is beneficial, I think actually it really is a great baby step number one for understanding a lot of concepts. That's great. Um, but what I think needs to happen, and this is where people get tripped up, is that we have to move from the education piece to the action. action. What yeah. does this look like practically at my organization? And right. this is the piece that concerns me because I see the interest, I see the desire to pick up and watch the videos, but we need to elevate the conversation so that we can translate that into practice. And so right. that, that's been, uh, that, that's been, even with those videos, it, it's really alluring because you feel like you're learning a lot and you are, but we just have to make sure we're, we're moving it forward. So I appreciate your comment. Thank you for that. Thank you. And then, um, Leanna, if you want to um, ask your question or I can ask it for you, she asks, um, do students play any role in the university's audit? That's an interesting question. So what typically happens is that the role that the students play is sometimes um, at the stage when the university does a, a racial climate survey, right? They want to make sure they understand how, let, let's use black students. Black students are, are experiencing campus life. And before they develop that survey, they might look to student government to give them feedback on some of the areas that they don't even know are issues for students. So they sometimes work in consultation with student groups, student black student leaders in particular to identify areas, areas of interest. Let me give you an example. And you know, it's, I think I can say this. So I, so I have several PhD students and one of them is a black man. And right after Joy's, George Floyd was murdered, he was stopped on campus by the police, uh, had a dog search his car and was put into handcuffs in the back of a police car on campus at USF during a quarantine. Um, and I was so upset by this, right? I, I was so upset. And I, I think what, what's important, what, the point that I want to say about this is that sometimes these things seem like they're so far away. Right. And I, I'm a sociologist. I study this. I know they're not far away, but it, even recognizing that it still was painful to hear him 
go through that, right? And I, I, so I, I say all of that to say, students have a very interesting experience on campuses. I and mean, that's just one element, because once, once you started talking about that, that actually led to other things that I didn't know as a black faculty member that this black man who's a student is facing. So I say all that to say, having student input is absolutely essential. Having input from staff is essential. You know, we sometimes really value what faculty have to say, right? We're considered the experts. And we do study this, we do research this, but I think that there's so, there's so much value in, in really having an audit that benefits from the input of so many people in different places. And that's sometimes missing in, in racial audits. Thank you for your question, Leanna. That was a good one. Um, and Mindy, you can go ahead with your question. So I, I started this uh, about seven minutes into it because I thought now that I was a Teams expert, but clearly I wasn't. So I was having teams challenges that um, so i missed uh your intro which might have answered this question but uh, we are actually actively trying to find someone to do some consulting with uh the organization i run uh the spring of tampa bay and so i'm just wondering if you do consulting <laughs> yeah i think you did miss that part what i was saying is i had yeah. literally just hung up with the consulting gig right before this oh, um, this has been so yes, I do. Okay. It, yes, but you know, let me let me also say this. Um, you, you should probably contact me soon if you'd like to to talk because this has been very busy. I'm going to leave okay. it at that. I will contact okay. you very soon. Then thank okay. you. Sounds good. Yes, you're welcome. And actually, I mean, I, the the spring is, is has a particular interest to me in the sense that I'm interested in violence against women, human right. trafficking. So. There's a lot that I'd have to say that I'd be interested in saying and contributing to any type of analysis that highlights the importance of anti-racism. That's actually it's 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 not, it's interesting that you're saying this because one of my next episodes will be about anti-racism and human trafficking, um, which might seem disparate, but there's some concerns about people's unwillingness to talk about racism and human trafficking. And, Right. But that's a different story. I won't even get into that, but I, I feel very passionately about that. And I see the Springs mission is very closely tied to, to what I do. So do reach out to me, Mindy. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sure. Sure. Other questions? Are there any other questions or comments? Well, so I have a question for folks then, since you all don't have questions for me. So one of the things that I was talking about is how do you move ahead? And so I wanna put some pressure on folks to, to start thinking about this, to saying out loud where you even think you might go next, right? All of you are probably part of organizations. I know you are, you're, even, even if you're not part of organizations, you have families. This isn't just a, a university company thing. What, when we're talking about uh, systemic racism, we're basically saying every part of your life, you need to evaluate and think about how systemic racism has shaped that. That's huge. I mean, this is this is why I also understand how it's scary, how this really uh, leads to lots of uncomfortable emotions because it's it's a big ask. And so I, I want to hear more from you all about what, what do you think? What are you going to do with this? What's the first step for you all? What what steps have you made already? And then realize that wasn't the right first step because sometimes it's also helpful to to be vulnerable and say, you know, I tried to do this, realized it didn't go well. So I'm I'm wanting to hear more from you all if you're interested in sharing that. I'll, I'll go. Okay. Um, so I have uh, a son, wonderful kid. Um, I'm divorced. My ex family is a little uh, far right. Um, and so I have regular challenging conversations with my 21 year old, you know, white son about right the fact that um, what he hears from his other side of his family um, isn't accurate. And those are tough conversations to have, but I consistently have them with him in hopes of him eventually understanding uh, the privilege that he enjoys as a white male, uh, even though you know he's being told that he, he doesn't have it um, or that it's being taken away from him. So. Right. You know, you start with one person and then you expand outward. So, and it's the shame of my life that I can't, that I've got a son who, 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 who is hearing those beliefs from the other side of his family and, and embracing them a little bit. 
yeah. I have the same problem in my family. My sister married a person who's far right. And we, I, I've been staying away from the house because every time I say, don't say that in front of me, I'm not going to tolerate it. He says, it's my house. Get out, you know, and I'm just, uh, I know that there's a division and I just don't know. So I just stay away from it. I'm not going to be part of it. You know, this is, this is a really interesting topic because one of the things that I've, I've talked about is that being anti-racist means that you're risking something. One of the things that you're going to risk and sometimes have to lose are relationships. And this is, when I say this is a big ask, we're talking about if, if you're if you're committed to anti-racism, you literally can't stand to be around this, right? This 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 hurts you to hear this stuff. And so this is it's difficult because people also have the realities of wanting to keep their families together, wanting to have the life that they imagine, which includes Uncle Bob and Uncle Joe, even if they're the ones who are who are who who are spouting things that aren't true. Um, and this is something that somebody in the box has said. What what I think is important is that you're pushing back on this. Is, is that you're not remaining silent. And I think as a mom, I've actually read some really interesting articles from white, from white moms in particular that talk about how they have to balance how much pressure to exert. Because sometimes pushing back could actually lead them to go even further down. And so there's a whole negotiation of how much do I say? Do I stop him every time he says something? And the reality is that we have to make these decisions and it actually can be counterproductive to respond every time, right? And so... So this is a process. It's a negotiation that doesn't have simple answers. But what we do know is that it does need to be consistent. Consistent doesn't mean every time it happens, but it means that um, this person is clear, not only that you disagree, but you're able to articulate why what they're saying is wrong. And that sometimes is also a challenge. People know that doesn't quite sound right, but they can't really articulate. How do I explain why what he just said is problematic? And so that sometimes requires you to go back and do more work to educate yourself and prepare for that. And this is a lot, right? So this is this is labor. Um, when we're talking about families, those are the people who are typically closest to us. And when we're talking about a son, that's hard um, because you also want to be around. You don't want him to disown you, right? But then you also want him to want him to be able to respect people. Um, so that's a challenge. That's a challenge that doesn't have clear answers yet, but I think you're, you're in the right direction. I think you're doing what you need to do, which is, I, I think, good. I see some questions here in this box yes. that we'll make sure we answer. Um, Catherine um, asks, can you please provide examples on how organizations um, can measure the diversity training effectiveness? Yeah, no, this is really good. So let me let me first say that people are actually afraid to do this, right? So, so in the past, what's happened is that companies they get their diversity training, they check off the box, and let's not look back, right? That they weren't really invested in that, right? So if we think about this methodically, you need to have a pretest done, you need to have a pre-survey done, it needs to be a thorough one, and then you need to follow up with people who've been involved in that training uh, pretty often, not just at the end of the year, but pretty often because what we find, what research finds is that a lot of the, the diversity training, the implicit bias work, it's great for two weeks, right? People actually have to be reminded of this. You can imagine we are constantly getting images and messages from all over. So the, the challenge will be, and I think companies are still struggling with this, quite frankly, is to create some type of way to provide people with this consistent anti-racist messaging, but also in a way that doesn't overwhelm them, right? How do we create this so that people are also not like, oh, another anti-racist thing again? You know, so that this is a there's a there's a fine line, but one of the first ways to do that is to do this. This is the standard thing to do: this pretest and this post-test and uh, test or uh, surveys that happen along the way, much more often than they're being done now. Um, you might even start three months out if you can't do weeks out. It might be a month. It might be three months out, but something more that gives you a sense of how what's happening to people as time progresses. What are they taking from the the diversity training? And that's an interesting question because I want to say that. Um, one of the places where we see the most funding for this is actually police departments. And we have some disturbing findings that these trainings aren't doing what they say they're supposed to do, that a lot of times police officers are doing the training again as a checkbox, and they have a whole discourse. That there's, there's a whole culture of making fun of the fact that they have to go, and they're not taking it seriously. And this is clearly a problem for the very issue we're talking about in terms of Black Lives Matter. So if your company is struggling with that, it's, it's because they're folks are still figuring out how to do that. 
but I think that they haven't been ha they haven't had to be held accountable for this, so they haven't really invested the time necessary to do the follow up. So thank you for your question. Um, Darlene, maybe if you want to come on and clarify a little bit, um, she asks, is it compounded when you are a female and black? Oh, is what compounded? The answer is probably yes. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Darlene, do you want to chime in? I'm just wondering with all of the police and all of that, you see a lot of aggression toward black men. And that, that just makes me wonder if racism is a different experience for females and males. Absolutely. And, but it's different in a way that you might not imagine, right? Because what's interesting is that there's a whole movement about the fact that what's happening to black men, women are, black women are also dying at the hands of police officers. And there's a politics in the black community that actually devalues that. That, that actually we don't get as outraged when black women die. There's, there's a whole movement within Black Lives Matter. The founders actually said, we, we started as queer black women, but somehow queer black women are now erased. And this is something that we've seen historically where you have black men ending up being the representation of the race, right? So black women we support, our issues sometimes get raised, but not really. Um, so, I, so to answer your question, it is a different experience but but in ways that you wouldn't expect. So the type of walking down the street and being viewed as a threat, that's less likely to happen uh, as, a, as a black woman in, in the same way that black men are. An even better example, I don't feel afraid driving to campus late at night to pick something up. I do not allow my husband to leave the house and go to campus at night. It, it's just not going to happen. And if, when he does, I'm, I'm nervous, right? He doesn't feel that way for me because it's a different experience. Um, and we see this, Darlene, you find this interesting because of your interest in education. I did an episode on this where we see the criminality of black people experienced differently. And we see this in schools where black girls, for example, are 5.5 times more likely to be suspended or expelled when compared to white girls. Um, and we see, we see high levels of suspension, again, this notion of criminalization with kids. But what black girls are suspended for is when they don't act in ways that are considered feminine. And this is where it gets interesting, right? If they're talking back too much, if they're chewing gum, if if they're it, there's there's a whole performative part here that that black girls get punished by, and and on top of that, just in schools, and again, I'm just saying this because I think you'd be interested in this. What we find for black girls in the United States is skin color matters as well in ways that it doesn't matter for black boys. So dark skinned black girls are even more punished when they're not abiding by these feminine rules of behavior. Um, and we don't see that happen in schools for black boys, but it comes back up in the criminal justice system when we see that how long people are given for sentences, skin color plays a part. Not only does skin color play a part, but your facial features, the more African and black looking you look, the longer sentences you're getting. I mean, it's it's disturbing to, to think about this. But to answer your question, um, we see black men and women disadvantaged at every level, but the way that they're disadvantaged, how they experience their, their, their race, and how they experience their race and gender together are certainly different experiences. Thank you Thank for asking that. Thank you very much. Um, and then Crystal says, um, I struggle with being the sole black person on the team who wants to see change and wants to educate oh. without being too pushy or needy. Oh, wow, Crystal. I feel your pain. When I, when I did the, um, the, the, the YouTube episode on white allies, it was in response to me saying, I feel traumatized by seeing these, these, these videos of George Floyd, we have to do something. I mean, it's important that we recognize this. And the next email was, we wanna make you chair of the diversity committee. We wanna make you do this and that. And I'm literally saying, I can't even function right now. And the next response was, "How? what can you do for us? And I mean, there were so many levels to that. It felt like I was being dehumanized and exploited and not seen. And at the same time, I knew that if I didn't step up, the statement wasn't going to be the statement that needed to be written, um, that it would it would have holes in it. And so we had to compromise. I ended up saying, no, I will. I, you all work on this. Do the work. I will read it and provide you with comments. But really, I, I don't have to be at the center of this. And I think sometimes, Crystal, we have to we have to let white people feel uncomfortable, push them into their discomfort zone, make them do the work. They're going to make mistakes. It's okay. 
I don't even have the perfect answer. And I think that that's the detail. The, the assumption is that if you're a black person, you magically have the answers. I mean, I have a PhD, I've studied racism, so it, it makes sense to ask me to do this. But that's not the case for, for most black folks. But they're still being asked to, like you, Crystal, are saying, is to kind of step up and solve this, this systemic racism problem. It's completely yeah. unfair, it's unrealistic, and it's another form of invisible and usually unpaid labor. Yeah. So, so my, my, I definitely, I have both sides of that. So one is where I am being asked, so there are individuals that, that are wanting to be allies and say, you know, can you help me? Um, so yes, that, that part can be uh, a little weighty um, because it's, yeah, like you said, we are, it, it's traumatic to the point that, you know, I've definitely tapped into employee assistance to get um, some therapy. Um, so I, that's the one side of it, but the other side is where there is deafening silence from, from those that I expect to be more open to it. And I'm, I'm not a shy person, so I've addressed it with those individuals, but when you get to a certain level, like at, at senior leadership level or, you know, that, that's above my pay grade, but I still made that conversation that uncomfortable conversation happened, but it's still seriously silent. And so I don't, I, I've, I've suggested webinars and, you know, I, I've put things out there, articles, but I don't know at what point I'm being too much for people that just don't want to deal with it. Yeah, no, this is, Crystal, this is, this is the issue. Th this is a fundamental issue. It's, it's what all of us are talking about, right? On Facebook, this is what all my friends are talking about. Um, and we're trying to figure out a, a way around this. In, in fact, th this this idea of what do we do with all of what do we do with all of this was really why it was the impetus for me creating the, the the YouTube channel. Because in my mind, what I wanted to do, I thought, let me make the videos so that we don't have to keep explaining this. If a white person sees my white allies video, they will get to stop asking your friend. Don't send this email to your friend. Um, and so, it, so what what I think we're both saying is, how do we how do, what do we do so that we're not bearing the, the burden and the labor, but how can we also ensure that things get done? How can we speak up? And, and do we speak up when it could mean that we move from what's called the, the office pet to the office threat? And let, let me explain this. I think this is a really important concept. You know, India was very generous in her, her uh, introduction of me and, and the accolades and things like that. And, um, and that's all great. But once you start calling out anti-racism, um, all of the awards and the accolades start meaning less and less to people because now I'm a problem. Now I move from being the pet, the person who gets all the stuff for the department, to being the problem woman who's demanding that we actually act in, uh, aggressively towards anti-racism. She should be grateful that she's here. This is an issue that a lot of us are facing, and I think that Crystal, you do have to be you you do have to be cautious about. Um, bringing these issues up. You have to kind of weigh whether or not folks are going to be open to it and weigh the risks that, again, we, we, we take when we stand up for this. I don't know if you all know this. I'll share this, but um, at USF, I, 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 I led the effort to, from the 88 or so Black faculty and staff to send a letter to President Corral and Provost Wilcox about systemic racism and what USF, recommendations for how USF can move forward. And I knew that doing that could be read in a negative way, but it, at what point, I mean, if I don't say anything now, I'll never speak, right? What, what does it take for us to stand up and say, you know what, I can't, I can't just be silent. But I think, Crystal, it also means that we can still be strategic. So even the way that I wrote the letter was, was done in a strategic way, providing clear, measurable goals, again, kind of going along with this idea of how, what can we measure, how can we hold people accountable? And so you do have to be strategic about that. And also know when you need to step back to protect your own mental health. That's something that we don't get to talk about. We almost don't even feel like we're allowed to be human and to feel and to just sit in our feelings. But I think that that's important too. And all of the, the desire to want to make a difference, we have to continue to center ourselves and our well-being um, because it's easy to, 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 to have this derail so much of us. Um, I don't know if that's helped, Crystal, but I, I, I just I relate to everything that you're saying right now. Absolutely. Very helpful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, and then India asks a question. Um, what can WLP 
do to be more of an ally? Well, I think that we can go back to that slide and we can go, we can, we can actually literally go down the line to, to see. So I think, I mean, my immediate response is what I like about WLP and what I've seen over the past few years is I like that the faces that I'm seeing are representing faces that I think are great. But remember, that's a diversity model. This is not just about putting brown and black faces up. I would like to see, and maybe LWOP does this already. I really want us to leverage the power of the group, the WLP leaders, to make sure that these recipients are integrated into those networks. This is so critical, especially for women, especially for women of color. So, and maybe WLP does that, but I, I and it's actually, I know it does to a certain extent, but I, I really think we can be more intentional about um, incorporating the, these young women into the networks in ways that lead to redistributions of power and resources, puts them in places where they can actually be set up for success. And one of you mentioned this in one of the other examples. So I'd like I'd like to see that. Um, the other thing I'd like to do, what I'd like to suggest is I'd like to see WLP do a little bit more in Black communities in Tampa. You know, I think that there's kind of some distance between WLP as an organization and the actual community. And I don't think it needs to be that way. I think that that we have folks who are interested, who have companies, that if we were intentional about thinking about how they could prioritize its systemic its systemic racism and how that impacts Black communities, this could really be powerful. And I'm saying Black communities, but we can also talk about uh, Latino communities as well. But I mean, for this for this purpose, I think that we can be much more intentional about that. I'd love to see that um, that happen. I'd, I'd love for us to even do. I'm calling it a racial climate survey. It wouldn't be that, but I'd love for you all to be asking recipients to talk about this because there's a whole experience of WLP. I mean, there and and I've, I've spoken to several of them myself, but there's there's a there's some pressures involved in getting grant funding from an organization that's a largely white organization, and it's not only just largely white, but folks are also relatively wealthy. A lot of the recipients don't come from that background, so they have to prepare for this for that banquet where you have that whole room of people there, that's a big deal in a way that I think people don't realize. Um, and that I had to remember as I was talking to, to some of these young, some of these young women. So really having that in tune and really having what's called an intersectional approach, remembering that this isn't just about racism. I'm, I'm talking about racism now because it, it's the easier thing to do. But even with Darlene's question, I really want us to think about how racism and sexism compound the challenges uh, that women, and particularly younger women of color, younger Black women in particular, are facing. So I encourage you to have these conversations, India. And, and that might mean that you're not actually at that table, right? That might mean that somebody else facilitates that so the women can feel free to really say, how they're experiencing WLP, how they really feel about whether or not the promise of mentorship and connection to WLP translate into real things. And that, that's going to mean you're going to get some critiques. You got to be open to that. But as long as you are, I think that's a great place to, that's just one of the places to start. I'd like, to, I'd like you all to track where people are going. If they, if they haven't gotten the opportunity, I'd like you to follow up with them and say, how can WLP help you? Um, there are a number of things. I mean, we can talk about I, that. This gets me excited because I love the recipients and they're so motivated and they're so inspiring. But we want to make sure that we're not losing people because that's what happens. They, we start off on these really great trajectories. And then what happens? Are, are we keeping track of whether or not they're able to make good on what we what we hope for, what they hope for themselves? So thank you for, for asking me that. Excellent. Um, then we have another question um, going back to the equity. Equality versus equity visual. Yeah. Um, how do we put these practices in um, into practice in the workplace? Mm -hmm. What does it look like in real life? Okay. Well, let me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this back to you all before I answer because I think that some of you have some answers for this, right? So if the idea is that every giving everybody the exact same is not going to address anti-racism, then what will? What will this look? What does it look like? To, to see color and race in a workplace setting. What does that look like? What's an example of how that might look? So before I answer, I'm going to throw it back to you all because I am certain that somebody has an answer about what that might look like. I'll wait. <laughs> oh, there's a hand up. 
I don't know if that hand is for this answer. Not. Yes, hi, it's Holly. This is my question. So I, <laughs> I oh. have one idea that popped into my head. <laughs> when you rephrased it like that, it, it, it helped me see it better. One idea, I don't know if this is correct, uh, is uh, actively promoting something like Black History Month to so that we can see the the as you said see it in the workplace see the color differences in the workplace so let me, let me just ask you this as a backup question so i can understand the context where do you like, do you work at a company a school and you don't have to say the name is it a is it for profit nonprofit? give me a sense of where you're working sure i work in the hospital oh a hospital okay so so group uh, what was your colleague? Kali is suggesting that, hey, one of the things we could do is create Black History Month as a way to be a first step into anti-racism. What's the feedback here? This is a strategy that lots of companies have done. Does it meet the anti-racism model? Well, I, I don't think it's an action in terms of the examples that you gave. But I'm, I'm one, I guess that's my question. The examples that you gave, are those examples of equality or are those examples of equity? The, because you gave us a list of examples. So, so I, I see this, I, I see that like doing a, recognizing Black History Month is more of a diversity strategy. It is, that's right. And, and let me just say this, diversity is not bad. So I'm not saying let's take all that stuff out, right? right? So, but we, we wanna, the, the word that I was trying to use, we wanna elevate this. So Black History is great, keep Black History, Great, but how can we elevate this, right? What can we do? We, so we want to celebrate ele Black history. What, what it sounds like you're saying is that we also want to increase the visibility of successful Black people in this space, right? At, at least that's the that's the idea of it. Um, but remember, okay. if we go beyond just thinking about representation and thinking about power and resources, where might that take us? So instead of Black History Month, might we what what might ha what what might happen? What else could happen? Black keep Black History Month. Don't don't do away with it. What else might a company do? <laughs> uh, well, I I guess I have to think about what do power and resources mean in the workplace. So does it mean sitting on a committee, give, giving someone access to have a voice on a committee? Uh, because I hear your point about it's not just about putting people in certain positions and checking that box. Even right. when they're in that position, how do we make sure that they have a voice? How do you make sure they have a voice and how do you make sure they're actually effective in that very position that you've now put them in? Because that also happens. Right. So, okay, so let's go back. Holly says black history. That's a that's a go to people kind of know to do that. But if the idea is that we're trying to transform the culture, let's say of this hospital that you work at, Black History Month might be part of that, but are there other things that we can do throughout the year? Let's not just limit this to Black History Month. This this is a big one here. This is what it's a it's a good baby step. Black History Month, yes. What else might we be able to do throughout the year that might promote not just only Black representation but anti-racism, right? So mm -hmm. remember, we want to move to anti-racism, and that might mean creating an entire series at your hospital that employees are attending that relate to some of the issues that they're dealing with. That might, that might mean having this be just a regular part of what your hospital does, if, if the idea is that you want to educate your staff members. The other thing is that I think that in a hospital, especially, I'd be very curious about, I, mean, I don't know what your possibilities are, about outcomes for patients. This is mm -hmm. a huge issue in the social sciences of how people are faring and how race shapes whether you will live or die. The, the fact that I was afraid that I would die when I had my daughter is ridiculous because I live in the United States, but that was very much a fear of mine that I would not survive. Um, mm -hmm. So we're really talking about anti-racism. We, we, there, there are levels here, especially at a hospital. Um, how do doctors understand their patients? I say this because there was a recent study that was showing that um, a significant percentage of, of medical residents believed these racist stereotypes about levels of black people's pain, the thickness of black people's skin. These are doctors who believe this. This is really important because this impacts th what's happening in the hospitals. So I don't know if you want to get that deep, but for a hospital, there are a number of things I could think about in terms of interventions that are anti-racist. Okay, thanks. So I, I put my camera on so you can see. Oh, yes, I can. 
You're in your car. But I'm in the car with a lot of light behind me. Um, not driving. Mm -hmm. So we're very fortunate that uh, we have a CEO who believes in this, and we actually are, are hosting a monthly forum, and we started right. a couple of weeks ago. And so that's why I'm. Uh, Robin invited me to to participate on the call tonight. Um, and I and we had a wonderful forum and and we talked about many of the things that people posted in the the chat box um, to really hear about the experience of uh, black women in particular where it was the overwhelming majority of participants. Yeah. Uh, and so I want to we, we want to keep doing this and then we want to make sure that it's not just Talk. all this talking. We want we yeah. want to get to what you're talking about the action. Yeah. So, so that's that's what I'm I, I need to you know I'm need to learn more about so so that we can actually move to action you know hearing people's stories is very important because we have to build awareness and understanding and appreciation and then we actually want to do something right and this is this is exactly so when I do these facilitations at the end of the facilitation there's usually a list of things that come up but there's a next step here the next step is for the leadership team to meet and say we've now heard what people have to say what are we prepared to do and invest in to make sure that we can move this from action to from from idea to action and so you know you ask what hospitals can do but i really think that what you should do has to be also informed by what people are saying i mean i'm telling you about the research that i know something else i haven't mentioned is just what it's like to be a black woman and a nurse in a hospital Mm -hmm. There's just so much to say about that. That I mean, that's a whole other conversation we should have, um, and and what that means. Just so many things that that means. Um, but I think that your actions need to be informed by what by what people are telling you, they are experiencing, and by what we know already in the research. So this is sometimes you know I companies ask me to come in, and I say you know what I'm going to do is put together the research that's already been done. I have not conducted this research, but I can find this and I can tell you what the issues are in your industry. You could also do that yourself. Um, okay. And so really challenging people to say, okay, if we're serious, either hire somebody to do the work or, or, or it's not going to happen. And I'm not saying it has to be you to do the, to do the job. Uh, it doesn't have to be you, um, Holly. I think it's Holly. Is that right? Yeah. But I, I think making the suggestion that this is worth investing in, this is worth putting aside this pot of money and having this goal at the end of having this consultant work with us to come up with this plan that we then discuss and talk about actionable items. And that doesn't have to take a year. There's some things that can have that have immediate responses. When we when you do these forums, often what happens is that there are at least three things that people that organizations can do immediately that they didn't even think about doing. That needs to happen immediately to be a good show of faith. But then that next step of long term thinking also needs to happen. But I'm excited that that CEO is invested. The healthcare industry is, is is scary, and it's a place that definitely needs to take more seriously this concern about anti-racism, um, and actually in ways that are beyond what I mentioned. But that for the healthcare industry, I mean, there's some really interesting subtleties about how implicit bias shape what's happening between doctors and nurses, doctors and patients, families and doctors. Oh, yeah. Okay. We yeah. Can I, I, interested. I'd be interested in talking to you more about what that might look like. Okay, thanks. I know I kind of took over the, the past several minutes, so, uh, but I just want to say thank you because many of the topics that you, that we covered tonight were brought up in the listening forum that we had a couple weeks ago, and, and we're administering a, a survey right now for the participants to find out, you right. know, what's their feedback what do they want us to cover in future sessions and 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 uh, like equality versus equity implicit bias these yeah. are things that people suggested uh the the recognizing black history month and, and other yeah. similar months to just yeah. raise awareness is something else that people have mentioned so so this is really helpful to kind of bring everything together for me yeah and you know let me let me also say this this piece about awareness it's great but it's also it can also be a trap Right. And the same thing oh. happens with human trafficking. There's so much awareness, so much awareness is great, people. I love awareness. But really, I mean, at what point we, we know it exists? Can, can we let's move to the action meeting, please? And yeah. I think that that's what you're saying. You're saying, how can we move this on? There needs to be a designated time, a person who's analyzing the data with action plans in mind. And see, I think that yeah. that's where things get lost. It's not enough to collect the data and just think that that's going to translate into action. Somebody needs to, to be, have a dedicated job to do that, put the resources into having that person do that or else or else it just becomes it becomes a fleeting thing.
But thank you so much, yes. Holly, for your comment. Yes, you're welcome. We're on that path, so I'm excited to have. Yeah, that's great. Validation from you that we're thinking in the right direction. That's thank right. you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Holly. And then we have one from uh, Jill McCracken. Um, she says, for mentorship, um, who is in charge of hiring and supporting employees? Uh, I was referencing the conversation about the hospital. And I just want to say I love your the, the, the conversation you guys had about outcomes because I think that's so, so important. But I was basically just offering some suggestions about mentoring okay. and keeping people around and supporting and hiring practices. So, yeah. Perfect. And you know, you know, actually, what I, what I was thinking, and this is a subtle thing, um, you know, we it, it's we're working on several different layers, right? So we're talking about hiring and retention, but there's also something on the ground that we have to talk about, which is the relationship between doctors and nurses, and the ways that nurses are often uh, viewed as disposable. If, if I'm being frank, and if you're a black nurse, even more so. And so there's some interesting, you know, I'm a sociologist, so maybe you would think I'd be less interested in this, but those interactions matter because they impact the patients. Um, and so I think being able to, to do an analysis, whether it's in the hospital or somewhere else, you might actually have to look at multiple levels to be able to understand the connection between this, what we call the meso layer, the micro level and the, ma the macro. Um, so anyway, thank you for your, thank you for your comment, Jim. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I don't see any other questions. Does anyone have any last minute questions or comments? This has been really good. Good. I have one last comment. Go ahead. Right. Happy birthday, Jessica Brazza. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. <laughs> happy birthday. Happy, happy day. Thank you so That's much. Nice. You didn't say that, Jessica. My lips are sealed. It's not my day. <laughs> this is more important. I'm happy to share that this day with you then. This is fun. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I think we can go ahead and wrap it up. I want to thank Elizabeth again um, for dedicating your time. You already said that you were on a two hour call today. Uh, so I really appreciate you spending this time and I appreciate um, all of the members and guests of members who have joined us um, for this really important conversation. Um, and I hope that these conversations continue and they move from just being conversations to being actionable. So thank you so much for being here. Um, Elizabeth, do you have any last comments you'd like to make? No, you know, this was for me, this was really a pleasure. I, I really feel passionate. I'm increasingly feeling passionately about this uh, because I'm kind of forced to talk about it all the time. But in some ways, it's great because it's the thing I was trained to do. And it's really only now that I feel like people are taking seriously why we spend all this time doing this work and becoming experts in this. And so for me, I feel like I want to take advantage of this momentum to really help folks translate this this what's what for me has been a theoretical argument to something more practical and that what we have going for us is that this is not the first time that we've been here the research is there we have we have so much good data on what needs to be done and now we have the interest in having that happen so i'm excited about what's possible i i have to be optimistic because being pessimistic is not an option because i have a son i have a black husband and i just i have to be optimistic and so i I'm hoping, I wanna encourage you all to keep pushing forward, to keep feeling uncomfortable, to not retreat, to really push yourselves, to be vulnerable, to be wrong, and to still keep going, because that that's, that's the key. So thank you so much for having me, and I hope to hear from some of you later on. Thank you so much. Everyone have a great night. Thank you. Bye.